Uh, all right, thanks for coming out tonight. This is a book. You know how you have these books that are with you for a long time, and um, that it's not always a pleasant thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, this book uh, I first came across when I was doing my doctoral work at Emory, and I saw it in the bookstore, <clears throat> and the, the original editions had, uh, there's a great Native American artist named Fritz Scholder, and he had a painting called Unfinished Crow that uh, is really striking. That was the original cover, and I thought, oh, what's this? And so I picked it up, <clears throat> and I, um, I thought, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'm an earnest graduate student. I'll put this on my shelf, and I'll get to it one day. <laughs> um, so I did, and I got lost and put it down. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, I'm getting a PhD in literature, but I don't know what's happening here. <laughs> so let's move on. Uh, so I did it again, and I got a little further, and again, I put it down. It was the third time before I was able to read it all the way through, and when I did, I still wasn't sure what I'd just read. This is one of those books for me. We've been together a long time. Uh, it's taught me so much. Uh, it's been very patient with me, as you can tell. But I would say that this book, Ceremony, has been, uh, well, is, uh, you know, I'm a literature professor. Don't tell anyone. I, I actually don't have a degree in philosophy here at the Philosophical Research Society. I'm a literature professor. And so I know literature and I know how to interpret it, but this one just was extremely difficult and that much more rewarding because of it. So I'm happy to share it with you tonight. It was for a time, I don't know if this is true anymore, <clears throat> it was for a time the most assigned novel on college campuses, uh, which I don't think is a good thing because <laughs> it's, it's not the kind of book you would read for class, well, I don't know. It's a difficult book. Um, it's also the deepest and broadest book I've ever read, I think. And maybe I'll be able to give you a sense of why as we move through it. Here's our passage for tonight. He cried the relief he felt at finally seeing the pattern. The way all the stories fit together, the old stories, the war stories, their stories, to become the story that was still being told. He was not crazy. He had never been crazy. See, I don't even know if I'm going to get through this tonight. This book means so much to me. Just take that. He was not crazy. You're not crazy. You'd never been crazy. He had only seen and heard the world it always was, as it always was. No boundaries, only transitions through all distances and time. So, this novel is by Leslie Marmon Silko. <clears throat> Her father is Lee Marmon, who is a famous Native American photographer. If you've ever traveled through the Southwest, especially New Mexico, and stopped at a gas station and gotten a postcard, you might have seen this postcard. It's called White Man's Moccasins, and that's Jeff from Laguna Pueblo. Uh, Jeff did not like his picture taken, so Lee had to give him a cigar to make him sit down long enough to get his photo taken. For Silco, she says, my family is, this is a quote from her, my family are the Marmons of Old Laguna, Pueblo, uh, on the reservation. Now, if you've ever been to New Mexico and you've been <clears throat> come from California, you're going east and there's, there's a little rise and then just off to the left, you wouldn't see it, is Laguna, Pueblo. And about 40 miles later, you'll hit uh, Albuquerque. So there are 19 Pueblos in the United States, many of them follow the Rio Grande or uh, follow rivers in that area. <clears throat> Laguna is one of them. So her family, she says, my family, are the Marmons at Old Laguna on the, the Laguna Pueblo Reservation where I grew up. We are mixed bloods. Laguna Mexican white, 
but the way we live is like Marmons. And if you are from Laguna Pueblo, you will understand what I mean. All those languages, all those ways of living are combined and we live somewhere on the fringes of all three. But I don't apologize for this anymore. Not to whites, not to full bloods. Our origin is unlike any other. My poetry, my storytelling rise out of this source. All right. Um, so Silco began publishing when she was 11. A magazine called Nasty Asty. <laughs> she had attended Laguna Day School and then eventually moved to the Catholic Day School in Albuquerque and in the sixth grade there was a dirty joke going around and the young and precocious Leslie Silco decided well, probably because she knew somebody would be punished for it, she decided it needed to be recorded, chronicled in a magazine. And so um, she thought she would publish the dirty joke. Um, and she edited and printed two copies of Nasty Asty. Um, she decorated the pages with silhouettes, bunny tails and ears cut from her father's Playboy magazines. <laughs> Handprinted two copies of it for distribution to the class. And she writes <clears throat> in one of the introductions to her books that she thought about cutting out the bare breasts to adorn the magazine, but she knew that that would take attention away from the text. <laughs> <laughs> At 11, she knew that. <laughs> and so um, she did not use the pictures of the breasts. Uh, and she did not take the Playboy stuff too seriously because she remembers her mother told her that that was silly and ridiculous stuff. Uh, so she worked way into the night to produce her magazine, which was very well received by the Catholic day school sixth grade. <laughs> and of course, the punishment came. She was called into the principal's office eventually, but she was saved by the loyalty of her classmates who argued, these 11-year-olds, that the story was going around orally anyway. All Silco did was publish what was already in existence. Remember this story. Uh, we will come back to it. She says that uh, this incident is very telling for her and her negotiation of boundaries, especially with creative work. And she learned that the written word <clears throat> carries far more weight than the spoken word because nobody got punished for the story going around. They are called into the office. The violation occurred when it was printed. As with Akhmatova, she drops out of law school. Uh, hers is a really interesting case because she had a scholarship at the University of New Mexico. She graduated with her bachelor's degree there, had a law scholarship <clears throat> designed for Native people to seek justice in the U.S. legal system. And uh, she, <clears throat> they read a case where um, the Supreme Court heard a case about a, the execution of a black man who was clearly developmentally disabled and they executed him anyway. And so she, she writes this, that case was the breaking point for me. I wanted nothing to do with such a barbaric legal system. She decided then, and again, she's gonna be what, 23? Uh, that there was no way to get justice in the American legal system, but she still wanted justice. How was she gonna get it? Through storytelling. And so she made that her life. She goes to graduate school in English, doesn't last long there, but one telling memory is a class on William Blake, right, which you all know about, uh, and especially his use of image and text, right? Now, she's way ahead of William Blake because she did Nasty Asty at 11, <laughs> uh, but she recognized a fellow genius, no doubt. She was married uh, to John Silco, and he was, um, he worked for uh, the justice system, worked for native legal and um, 
land rights and moved to Ketchikan, Alaska. Now, Silco and her family, the Marmons, um, have been on that land, especially the Marmons, since 1880. Uh, and it's, it's an area south of Laguna, between Laguna and Acoma Pueblo, if you know the area. Um, vast, uh, high desert with mesas and everything. I've been on it, actually. Uh, and so she moves from there to Ketchikan, Alaska, okay, uh, with her husband and her young child, and writes ceremony there. Now, ceremony is a novel, as you'll see, about the Laguna area. So she's doing all this from memory, right? From some deep memory of the landscape and what it means to her. She eventually moves to Tucson, Arizona, um, where she writes another novel, Almanac of the Dead. There she is. So she's born March 5th, 1948 in Albuquerque. 1974, she publishes a book of poems called Laguna Woman. So she actually begins as a poet. She says she is a short story writer. That's how she always thought of herself. But then she got um, a contract to do uh, a, a publication for uh, Penguin, and she didn't know anything. She says she didn't know what she was doing, so uh, she just said, you know, I'll write anything. So they come to her with the idea for a novel. And she said, I, I didn't, she says this in her work, I didn't take how to write a novel in college. So she, she said, I know how to do a short story, I know how to craft something in that limited space. I didn't know what the hell to do with a novel. So uh, that's the contract. She does it, and it becomes ceremony in 1977, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. 1981 is Storyteller. It's a really interesting book. Uh, it's, it looks like a scrapbook. It's long, like this, like a picture album. Do you remember picture albums and scrapbooks? Uh, and it's got her photographs in it and some of the old photographs of the Marmons in Laguna. Some of her poetry from Laguna Woman, some new short stories, some old short stories. It's, it's a really nice piece of work, very unusual in terms of genre. In 1991, after moving to Tucson, she writes Almanac of the Dead. Now remember, she, she went to law school to get justice for her people, and she never gave up on that. Um, she just decided to do it through storytelling. So Almanac of the Dead is, Silco says, my 762-page legal indictment of the United States. Um, it is. I honestly don't recommend you read it. Uh, it is, again, I, I'm a literature professor. I've read a lot of literature. I like the dark stuff. I have never read anything so dark in my life. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. It's this massive, it, it, well, in fact, what she based it on was the Popol Vuh, the Mayan um, codexes, the folding text. And so it reads like that. You've got, I counted it once, I think there's like 62 different protagonists, um, five different countries, not just settings, but countries. And they all kind of are orchestrated, moving toward Tucson. It's amazing. Um, it's, it's incredibly powerful and extremely difficult to read, um, but worth it. I would say worth it, but settle in if you decide to read it. <laughs> settle in. 1999 was um, a very different take, Gardens in the Dunes, about two little girls in the 19th century who are abducted and moved through the American Southwest and are actually um, taken care of by a radical group of Mormons who find themselves in great sympathy with the native people at the time. Uh, very worthwhile and very interesting. The Turquoise Ledge is her latest book, 2010. It's a memoir, very nicely done. Um, as you can see, uh, she hasn't, there's not a great output here um, compared to say Louis Erdrich, who is an Ishinabe who probably has four times this many works, but then Ceremony Storyteller and Almanac of the Dead, uh, that is 
you could read those three and understand Native America uh, and those voices and those stories. So this is the opening of ceremony and I wanted you to see it and it's amazing how difficult it was to present this to you because everything now is online and so it comes through a reader. I just wanted you to see the pages because this is how she lays them out. Notice the white space, notice the effect on your eye as you move through here and I'm going to get to the text, don't worry about that, but okay so you see a lot of white space here starting on the right side. It's a creation myth that I will read you. Then here's the next page. Again, lots of white space, more stories, and then sunrise. Sunrise on the left side of the page, and then the novel begins. This is all deliberate. This is very, this is nasty asty. She's doing the same thing. Uh, she's trying to lay out the text in an imagistic way, right? Here's the opening, that, the first words of the novel. Seizinako, thought woman, is sitting in her room, and whatever she thinks about appears. Okay, so you see why I was confused from when I first read this book. What, why are you starting a novel this way? Who the hell is Seizi Nako? And what room is she in? And wait, she's creating the world with her thoughts? Yes, <laughs> she is. Um, so, you'll see who that is and what that means uh, shortly. By the way, the, the artist tonight is John uh, Quick to See Smith, my favorite Native American artist, uh, and really powerful images here. And she's, she's a prolific painter and very powerful one, as you can see. All right, so the first words after the opening myth and response. There's a kind of dialogue there at the beginning that I'll get into later uh, with Seetsi Nako and these other voices and uh, the importance of stories. But here's where the knot for the pro section begins. Teo didn't sleep well that night. Um, and again, he's woken up. So you've got sunrise across the page and Teo waking up, right? By the way, Silco says Teo, so I know in Spanish it would be Tayo. I don't know why she says Teo, but she does. <clears throat> and the first thing that happens to our character, Teo, is that he's a mess. He is, well, let me just read it to you. He, he could feel it inside his skull. The tension of little threads being pulled and how it was with tangled things, things tied together. And as he tried to pull them apart and rewind them into their places, they snagged and tangled even more. So Teo had to sweat through those nights and then thoughts became entangled. He had to sweat to think of something that, it, that wasn't unraveled or tied in knots to the past. Something that existed by itself, standing alone like a deer. And if he could hold that image of the deer in his mind long enough, his stomach might shiver less and let him sleep for a while. I don't know about you, but that's the best description of being a mess I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> I feel it every time I read it. I know that feeling viscerally, thoughts firing off, and you can't, they're entangled, and you can't get them under control, and all you want is one single thing that you can focus on to make all these voices and images stop, right? So that is Teo. Um, and Teo is sick, according to the novel, for a number of reasons that we'll get into, but mainly because he cannot see the pattern. He cannot see the pattern. He observes all of the elements just fine. In fact, too fine. He can see everything that's happening and, and them moving against each other. But there's no story that will put these elements in relation, into relation, in a meaningful way. So, one of the reasons I had difficulty, and most readers have difficulty with the first third of the novel, is that Silco replicates this process in the reader. Sudden scene shifts, time shifts, 
voices that come into the text that you haven't heard or know. In fact, there's still things in the text. I don't know where they come from. Uh, and there's a separate little section on bears. And I'm like, okay, but how does this relate? It doesn't, which is the point. It's all this stuff in Teo's head. Just, and no relation, no pattern, no narrative he can put it into. So you will feel it. <clears throat> now, another reason Teo is sick is that he cursed the rain away. Quote, so he had prayed the rain away, and for the sixth year it was dry. The grass turned yellow and did not grow. Wherever he looked, Teo could see the consequences of his praying. Now, why would a Laguna man living in the high desert there pray the rain away? Ah, well, it's because he was in the Second World War. As many Laguna people and as many native people were. Uh, I don't know if you know the Johnny Cash song, The Ballad of Ira Hayes. Do you know Ira Hayes? Ira Hayes, do you know the Iwo Jima statue? Marines planting the flag. Okay, one of those guys is Ira Hayes. He's a Laguna Pueblo. He came back from the war. He was memorialized in the statue. He came back from the war. He was dead within a year from alcoholism. Well, you know, that was the proximate cause, as we see. Teo went to war with his cousin Rocky, who is, Rocky is, is this archetype of the perfect man, uh, the perfect man for Western culture. He's, uh, well, and I guess for Laguna culture too, at least in Teo's eyes, because he's his big brother, I mean, his, his big cousin. Um, Rocky's just like perfect. He's athletic, he's strong, he's not especially bright, but hey, that's an advantage uh, in, in some ways and in some cultures. And so actually it's the recruiter who gets Rocky to sign up and Teo wanting to be with his cousin whom he adores and idolizes joins too. So they're both in the Philippines and they end up taken prisoner by the Japanese and forced on the Bataan Death March. Um, so they are marched literally to death and uh, before they arrive at the prison camp where they're being marched, Rocky dies um, as the rain comes down. The description here is horrific as the Japanese so soldier rams the butt of his gun into Rocky's face and shatters his skull. It was, and all this is happening, Rocky just kind of disappears. This is the jungle. He kind of disappears into the rain and mud. He just, like he's being eaten and absorbed. And that's when Teo cursed the rain. The incessant rain that buried his beloved Rocky in mud and water. Now, a really interesting part of uh, the novel is how the other characters, especially the other veterans, respond. And so there are his, I was gonna say friends, they're, Harley's his friend, but the others are not especially his friend. And they're veterans and they've come back. And one of them, his nemesis is named Emo. And Emo says this about the drought. Emo liked to point to the restless, dusty wind and cloudless skies, to the bony horses chewing on fence posts beside the highway. Emo liked to say, look what is here for us, look. Here is Indian's mother earth, old dried up thing. And Teo's anger made his hand shake. Emo was wrong, he was all wrong. So Teo knows this. He knows that's not the way. He's no, he knows that's not the path to healing, quite the opposite. It's a new kind of sickness. But at the same time, he cannot stop himself. He comes back to Laguna, again, Rocky has been murdered. And eventually, of course, uh, the Japanese lose the war. And over there in the Philippines, Teo is ordered to shoot the Japanese soldiers. And he refuses. So they send him home. 
And he refuses because all he can see in the faces is his uncle Josiah, right? Because he's another human being. Remember this too as part of the ceremony. The only cure I know is a good ceremony. That's what she said, is one of the opening lines of the text that I showed you there. Teo is told to shoot these soldiers, but he can only see a relative, right? Even though these are Japanese soldiers he's never met, all he can see is a relative. So he goes to the army psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist says, what's wrong with you? And he says, I feel like white smoke. You ever feel like white smoke? Insubstantial, incoherent, nobody can see you. You kind of move through things and they move through you. And the psychiatrist does what a psychiatrist does. He gives him some medicine. Now, up to this point, Teo has been vomiting and urinating uh, a lot, too much. He's, and so it's clear he's kind of purging himself of something, or trying to purge himself of something, some sickness, some poison. And so that's why he ends up at the army psychiatrist. Is, um, they're trying to treat him for this. Obviously, it doesn't work. And in fact, there's an amazing scene after he visits, visits the psychiatrist where he goes to the train station and he, he vomits into the trash can and he passes out. And uh, this is in um, Albuquerque, so it's a you know, little bit of a cosmopolitan city. So he wakes up and there are Japanese faces around him because there were Japanese tourists there. And he's just like, I don't, you know, right? I can't see the pattern. I can't put this together. This makes no sense. I was just over there killing you or being told to kill you. And here you are in, in my home. Um, it doesn't make sense. But the Western medicine does at least get him released from the hospital, which is, of course, the primary goal of Western medicine, is to get you out of the hospital and out of care. Now, here is, I'm kind of going through the first third of the novel with you, um, this especially confusing part. And here's something else very strange happens. We get a story in verse of ancient Laguna, myths. They just pop up. So Teo's throwing up at the train station and next we hear a story about reed woman and corn woman. And again you're like, wait, what? Did I, did I miss a transition? No, it just pops up. And this is the story. In the summertime, reed woman, right, she's a reed, she lives in the water, she spent all her time bathing, sitting in the river splashing down the summer rain, as the novel puts it. Her sister, Corn Woman, works very hard every day in the field, sweating and getting sore hands. Finally, Corn Woman tires of her sister's behavior, because you know how sisters are, and expresses her anger by scolding her for bathing all day long. Reed Woman responds, by returning to the fourth world. Pueblos believe this is the fifth world. She goes back to the fourth world. By the way, the Hopi, who are Puebloan, believe that, um, that you can get, that they came out of the fourth world at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. In a little tiny hole about like this, that a spider can come out of, it's called a sipapu. How amazing would that be if you really believe that? If you really believed you lived in the fourth world or your ancestors did, and you came up into the fifth world through a little hole at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it would change everything. Honestly, it would change everything. You would treat the land differently. You would treat this life differently. Well, Reed Woman goes back, quote, to the original place down below, and there was no more rain. Ah and start to see the faint outlines of a connection here. All right, there are, um, well, there are three main women in Teo's life, at the beginning at least. There is Auntie, Old Grandma, and Laura. Auntie 
has adopted the colonial Christian faith and is um, extremely judgmental. Although you get the feeling she was always judgmental. She didn't need Christianity to help her with that. Uh, but it's there, you know, and, and you can use it that way. She's also a gossip, so very interested in the goings on in the Pueblo. Um, and she's incredibly mean to Teo, uh, and she raises him. Uh, because you'll hear about his mother in a minute. <clears throat> there is old grandma, and old grandmas are usually pretty cool. And this old grandma is pretty cool. So this old grandma, is not crazy about her daughter, auntie, you know, who's, well, would that be her daughter? Or anyway, she's not crazy about auntie, um, but tolerates her. Is very interested in Teo, but not intrusive. Uh, just kind of watches, sees what's going on, you know. And eventually, and uh, occasionally, will chime in some things and eventually has the last line in the novel, which is, old grandma should have that. And then there's Laura. Laura is Teo's mother. She's dead. Um, she's been dead a long time. Uh, she would go with white men. And uh, auntie would find her sometimes down by the river with nothing but high heels on in the morning and eventually she dies uh, under mysterious circumstances. Now let me just give you a sense of the depth of this novel that I was talking about. So we read this and we register, okay, Laura was, Laura was troubled and maybe she was a prostitute, whatever, she slept around with white men and there's a kind of, maybe at the edge of your thoughts, there's a kind of, well yeah, you shouldn't do that, so there. But in Laguna, anybody would recognize Laura as a majestic mythological figure named Yellow Woman, who is a hero to the Pueblo people. She goes down by the river and she meets a Kachina, a mountain spirit, and goes away with him. Right? You see how it kind of overlaps with the negative? She goes away with him and she leaves her family. She's married. She leaves her family and she comes back bearing twin boys. Silco loves this story um, and, and tells it in many different ways. The twin boys are born and they become the culture heroes of Laguna Pueblo. A culture hero is a mythological figure that teaches you how to live, that brings culture to you. Right? So, Yellow Woman's Konichinaki is her name. Uh, Kenichi Nako, which she, when she sins, is not a sin, of course, it's she crosses the river and she brings back culture. Laura, Teo's mother, there's no more yellow woman. She, she is a yellow woman figure, but there is no room for the yellow woman myth, and so she gets destroyed. I could do all night on Yellow Woman. She's an amazing figure. So these are the three women in his life, the main women in his life. All right, so old grandma says, you know what? You, uh, you got released from the hospital, but I can tell you're not well. I want you to go see old Kush, the Pueblo medicine man. And he doesn't want to. I mean, Teo's been out in the world, he's traveled, he's been to the big cities like San Diego and, <laughs> and other cities. Um, and he's like, Grandma, this is just superstition. And so she has to work very hard to convince him to go see Kush. And Kush is an old man and he, he knows what he knows and he's not seen as much as Teo has seen, at least in terms of the contemporary white world. <clears throat> And so he tries to help Dale. And one of the first things he says is, have you killed someone? Or have you been a part of a group that has murdered? And Dale says, I don't know. And Kush says, I don't understand. And of course he doesn't understand because he doesn't know about bombs or long range weapons or, or killing a man you don't know that you've never met before. 
He just doesn't understand. And so he does the best he can with Kuish does with Teo. And uh, he does have this. He, he says this. He acknowledges his limitations. Kuish says, there are some things we can't cure like we used to, not since the white people came. But he does give Teo some instruction. And this is Silco. He, uh, the instruction is, you know, my son, this world is fragile. And here's Silco, the narrator. The word he chose to express fragile was filled with intricacies of a continuing process. And with a strength inherent in spider webs woven across paths through sand hills, where early in the morning the sun becomes entangled in each filament of the web. It took a long time to explain the fragility and intricacy because no word exists alone. And the reason for choosing each word, each word had to be explained with a story about why it must be said in this certain way. This was the responsibility that went with being human. Old Kuish said, the story behind each word must be told so that there could be no mistake in the meaning of what had been said. And this demanded great patience and love. Teo improves, but not enough. One of the things that changes is that he can no longer drink. <laughs> he, throws, he stops throwing up unless he drinks. Then he throws up immediately. Okay, so alcohol in native people uh, is a long and, and tragic story. I don't know if you remember Dances with Wolves. Do you remember the scene I'm thinking of where the, um, the uh, Oglala come and visit him at his camp and he makes coffee for them and he plops sugar into their coffee. Uh, apparently, I don't know, but I've read that among indigenous people there's a weakened um, resistance to sugar. Uh, that, you know, their, their constitution, just where they're from, their ethnicity makes it so that they're susceptible to sugar and sugar products like alcohol. I don't know. Um, this is what the novel says. Liquor was medicine. Right? Liquor was medicine for the anger that made them hurt. For the pain of the loss. Medicine for tight bellies and choked up throats. He was beginning to feel a comfortable place inside himself. He's starting to drink again. Close to his own beating heart, near his warm belly. He crawled inside and watched the storm swirling on the outside, and he was safe there. The winds of rage would not touch him. And for anyone who's done that, who's gone to that place through alcohol or something else, I think that's exactly right. You're finding a comfortable place inside yourself to watch the storm outside. Now, this is uh, what I read to you was uh, a scene in a bar that I want to elaborate on because this is Teo's story. So he and his friends, the veterans, Emo, Harley, Leroy, and some others, they go to this bar and they start drinking and they start telling stories. And for the others, it's about the con conquest of white women. It's about sleeping with as many white women as they can about, basically about passing as white. That's what all their stories are about. Teo says, I got a story. He's now been drinking. He says, I got a story for you. One time there were these Indians, see? They put on uniforms, cut their hair, they went off to a big war. They had a real good time, too. Bars served them booze. Old white ladies on the street smiled at them. At Indians. Remember that, because that's all they were, Indians. These Indians fucked white women. Had as much as they wanted to. They were MacArthur's boys. White whores took their money, same as anyone. 
These Indians got treated the same as anyone. Hear that refrain? Wake Island, Iwo Jima, they got the same medals for bravery, the same flag over the coffin. Now his friends are saying this story is not going to a place where they want it to go. So they interrupt Teo, order more drinks. Teo gets upset and he says, no, no, I didn't finish my story yet. See, these dumb Indians thought these good times would last. They didn't ever want to give up cold beer and blonde cunt. Hell no. They were America the Beautiful too. And this was the land of the free, just like teachers said in school. They had the uniform and they didn't look different no more. They got respect. He could feel the words coming out faster and faster. The momentum, momentum building inside of him like the words were all going to explode. And he wanted to finish before it happened. I'm half breed. I'll be the first to say it. I'll speak for both sides. First time you walked down the street in Gallup or Albuquerque, you knew, don't lie, you knew right away. The war was over, the uniform was gone. All of a sudden, that man at the store waits on you last, makes you wait until all the white people bought what they wanted. And the white lady at the bus depot, she's real careful now not to touch your hand when she counts out your change. You watch it slide across the counter and you know, God damn it, you stupid sons of bitches, you know. That is Teo's story. And later, as the men, the veterans, begin to tell their stories again, and again, it's the conquest of white women and basically passing as white, even though they're from Laguna. The narrator says they began to beat their beer bottles like drums, as they told the story. You see what's happening there, right? The ceremony is being perverted and profaned to tell this story. This is a drum circle, and it should be in a ritual setting, but it's in a bar, and it's the wrong story. It's the wrong story. Well, after this scene, we get another one of these verse sections of the novel, which is right out of Laguna mythology. And it's Pacayanyi's story. And uh, it's, it's about the twins Masiwi and Oyu Yewi. And they were, um, they were, their job, these twins, was to make sure the corn altar was kept in shape and attended to and had corn for corn woman, right? And then there is Pakayanyi's magic that comes along and Pakayanyi says, hey, you, you, know, you have to do that. Um, let's do it through magic. And they get distracted as we do. They get distracted by this magic and do not attend to the corn altar. And so corn mother takes away the plants and the grass and the rain clouds. It's not a big deal. You don't pay attention to something, it goes away, right? Pretty simple. Fortunately, there's Hummingbird's story. The wind stirred the dust. This is another one of these verse interludes right, that don't fit but do as you move through the text. The wind stirred the dust, the people were starving. She's angry with us, the people said. Maybe because of that Chiokyo magic we were fooling with. We better send someone to ask for forgiveness. They noticed Hummingbird was fat and shiny, had plenty to eat. They asked how come he looked so good. He said, hey, down below, Three worlds below this one, everything is green. All the plants are growing, the flowers are blooming. I go down there and eat. Right? What a brilliant story. You've got to go back to the source. Right? You've, and we're going to see that later on. Brilliant little story. So, Emo's story, again, Teo's nemesis here. He has, they're at the bar, he has a bag on the table and he's playing with the bag and it makes a noise. 
And they say, of course, what's in the bag? And he says, it's the teeth of a Japanese soldier I killed. So it's a little fetish for Emo. And he starts telling a story again, and it's the same old story about how they had sex with white women and they were just like white people. They were living the life of white people. And so Teo breaks his beer bottle and stabs Emo in the stomach with it and says, and stops the story. Remember that too. And then there's Laura's story, his mother's, the one that I've already mentioned. This is Yellow Woman, a, an amazing, powerful hero, hero figure in Laguna mythology that she is prevented from living out by the changes that have taken place. She is Yellow Woman. She is the Night Swan. There's a whole thread here, more than a thread, a current of women in this novel and their role in healing that echoes Laguna Pueblo mythology and culture. Laura is not healed, but the Night Swan is a dancer that Josiah meets, his uncle Josiah meets when he's in Cubero. And she's, she's not just a one night stand, in fact, she's they're together several nights, but she's a mythological figure. She's yellow woman. And all these things start to converge as you read through the story. Um, the night swan, and then eventually we will meet a woman named Sepina. And I'll show you to her, I'll show her to you in just a minute. So eventually, and again, I'm skipping over vast amounts of stuff to get the story to you in hopes that you'll read it for yourself. Teo, after Kuish's ceremony, starts in motion. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. Kuish does not give him a ceremony. Kuish just does the best he can and starts Teo on his journey. So Kuish is kind of like the oracle. He's kind of the call to adventure. Teo doesn't yet know what he's doing, but eventually he does. And it, and it happens through these women that he meets. Um, he actually meets the Night Swan, Josiah's lover. Um, so he has to connect with women. And, and I don't mean the feminine. He has to connect with women. He has to connect with that energy, with Mother Earth, with the feminine healing powers. And he does this eventually. He goes to a place called Dripping Springs. I've actually been there. It's this cave in the mesa where water just, there's a pool of water and it keeps dripping and it's, it can be 95 outside the cave and it's like 70 inside the cave. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Um, and so he spends some time there with a woman named Say, T-S-E-H. And then the stories start to mean. Remember at the beginning, he could not see the pattern. It was madness, it was too much. He couldn't put it in any order. He just wanted one thing. But there's not just one thing, is there? There are many things. They need to be in a story, in a pattern. So he's at the pool, Dripping Springs, which is on the Marmon Ranch. And here is the line. Here is the section. Dragonflies came and hovered over the pool. They were all colors of blue. And color means so much in this novel. Powdery sky blue, dark night blue, shimmering with almost black, iridescent light, and mountain blue. There were stories about dragonflies too. He turned. Ah, I love that line. He turned. He turned, right? You have to turn. If you're miserable and sick, you have to turn. All right. He turned. Everywhere he looked, he saw a world made of stories. The long ago, time immemorial stories, as old grandma called them. It was a world alive, always changing, always moving. And if you knew where to look, you could see it. Sometimes almost imperceptible, like the motion of stars across the sky. By the way, this is Sepina. It's Mount Taylor, which you can see from the freeway. 
but the Laguna name is Woman Veiled in Rain Clouds. That's a lot better than Mount Taylor. Isn't it? <laughs> and isn't that, that's it, right? She's a woman veiled in rain clouds. So this goes with Teo's epiphany, is that the world is made of stories. So now I don't see Mount Taylor, uh, Mount Taylor I see Sepina. I see the woman veiled in rain clouds. And I see women everywhere. And I need to connect with them for healing. And in fact, when he and Say, and by the way, all these names begin with T-S, say Pina, um, say, and then remember at the beginning, say it, say Nako, thought woman, all connected, right? And he and say, make love, have sex in, at Dripping Springs, and this line begins his healing. She moved under him, her rhythm merging with the sound of the wind shaking the rafters and the sound of the rain in the tree, and he was lost somewhere, deep beneath the surface of his own body and consciousness, swimming away from all his life before that hour. So I don't mean something trite when I say that Teo has to reconnect with women, because this is what women do. They are the source of life. That's all that is, but that's enough, right? Swimming away, because there's water there, right? Deep beneath the surface of his own body. Swimming away from all his life before that hour. Oh my God, I hope you've had this experience of swimming away from your life, especially when you're sick and lost. So, this is a book about ceremonies, or one ceremony. Where do we get the ceremony? Now again, I've taken you through about the first third of the book. So I'm not gonna take you through the, sec the last two thirds with the same pace. We need to meet Bethany. Bethany is an amazing figure. He's a Navajo medicine man who lives up above Gallup. And uh, he collects calendars and clocks Native stuff, Navajo stuff, Diné stuff, but also everything he can get his hands on. And Teo tells him what happened to him. And he says, you were right to see your uncle Josiah in the faces of those Japanese soldiers. Thousands of years ago, we were the same family. So you're not crazy, right? You're not crazy. And the text reads, Teo's sickness was only part of something larger. Ah, something larger. And his cure would be found in something great and inclusive of everything. Do we get those cures here, today, in 2019, in America? Do we get a cure that is great and inclusive of everything? We get a pill. Fine. But this is the cure we need. We need to be related to everything or we're not going to get well. How does Bethany do this? After all, Kuish was a respected medicine man, uh, beloved by his tribe. But he couldn't really do anything for Teo. He got him to stop drinking most of the time. But Bethany, Bethany has a different way. Here's Bethany speaking of his method. There are some things I have to tell you, Teo. Bethany began softly. People nowadays have no idea about ceremonies. They think ceremonies must be performed exactly as they have always been done. Maybe because one slip up or mistake and the whole ceremony must be stopped and the sand painting destroyed. So he's talking about a Navajo sand painting, which is what a medicine man will do among the Navajo. And basically, it's a recreation of the world. You sit in the middle of the creation story because that's how you get well. You go back to the beginning. You get reborn. Okay. So that's why he refers to sand painting. That much is true. 
They think that if a singer tampers with any part of the ritual, great harm can be done, great power unleashed. He was quiet for a while, looking up at the sky through the smoke hole in the teepee. That much can be true also, but long ago when people were given these ceremonies, the changing began. If only in the aging of the yellow gourd rattle or the shrinking of the skin around the eagle's claw. If only in the different voices from generation to generation singing the night chant. You see, in many ways, the ceremonies have always been changing. Teo nodded. He looked at the medicine pouches hanging from the ceiling and tried to imagine the objects they contained. Bethany continues, at one time the ceremonies as they had been performed were enough for the way the world was then. But after the white people came, the elements in this world began to shift and it became necessary to create new ceremonies. I have, main I have made changes in the rituals. The people mistrust this greatly, but only this growth keeps the ceremonies strong. And later, Teo now starts to get it. He begins to see the way forward and he says something about um, white people, or I forget what he says, something about, Teo says something is bad. Bethany says this, hey, accidents happen and there's little we can do, but don't be so quick to call something good or bad. There are balances and harmonies always shifting, always necessary to maintain. It is very peaceful with the bears. People say that's the reason human beings seldom return from a bear visit. It's a matter of transitions, you see. The changing, the becoming must be cared for closely. You would do as much for the seedlings as they become plants in the field. Now, I like this very much because we're back to Heraclitus, where we began, right? All right, I need to... Uh, I need to wrap this up, but there's a, there's a witch contest. <laughs> the next verse section is a witch contest that where witches are called from all over the world, and um, uh, and the witchery creates something that I'll tell you about at the end. I just wanted to give you these words from the Sam Sam painting ceremony. This is part of this, the ceremony that Bethany gives him. I am walking back to belonging. I am walking home to happiness. I'm walking back to long life. Isn't that beautiful? All right. So, the ceremony is actually for Teo to find his Uncle Josiah's speckled cattle. So these are weird cattle they're like Mexican, and they don't have much meat on them, and they won't be contained. They'll just run through all the fences, and so they're Josiah's, and Josiah, his uncle Josiah, is dead now. So he has to go find these speckled cattle. Now, this is, this is the way the ceremonies are. They are nonsensical, right? He, he doesn't have to find the cattle, but that's the point. The, the ceremonies are excess. They are outside of your rational world. They should be irrational. Go find those speckled cattle. And of course, um, you find much more. And this is where now he, he can no longer drink. Once he begins the ceremony, he meets Say. And then at the end of the novel comes this incredible convergence, which is, according to the narrator, where the whirling darkness started its journey. So in the witch contest, they talk about the whirling darkness. What is this whirling darkness? Well, it's Trinity site. It's the place where the atomic bomb was first tested. That is the witchery. That's who won the witch contest, is the person, is the witch who said, let's make this. Let's make uranium. And let's teach the people how to turn it into destruction. 
And so, you know, it's a really interesting geography there. You've got Trinity site, I don't know if you've ever been there, where they tested the first atomic bomb. By the way, Enrico Fermi was in a bunker and they were taking bets, these scientists, these physicists, were taking bets on whether or not the state of New Mexico would be incinerated. And Fermi thought it would. So he lost the bet, <laughs> thankfully. Trinity site, Los Alamos, right? White Sands, Laguna. Laguna Pueblo's right there. And in fact, in Almanac of the Dead, uh, she describes the great stone snake, which is made of the tailings of the mining that was done there. So it's just, you know, a bunch of tailings from the mining laid out. But the people there saw a great stone snake. And Almanac of the Dead is about the great stone snake arising. So there's another little bit. Now here at Trinity site, guess who shows up? Emo. Emo's there to kill Teo. And he does kill Harley, right in front of Teo. And so Teo now has a screwdriver and he imagines driving it through the temple of Emo. But he doesn't. Remember before, he stabbed him in the belly, but now he says no. And this is the message of ceremony, is that it, will may, take, it may take a long time. And you should not be part of the witchery. And at the end, he cried at the relief he felt at finally seeing the pattern, the way all the stories fit together, the old stories, the war stories, their stories, to become the story that was still being told. He was not crazy. He had never been crazy. He had only seen and heard the world as it always was. No boundaries, only transitions through all distances and time. And this is the last page. Sunrise, accept this offering. Sunrise. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening.